let's replace our fear with faith and hope in dating and see where that gets us. Because I promise when you do that, you will have different results and you will enjoy the process more. And at the end of the day, things are going to work out. Um, it's like President Hinckley. Everything works out in the end. If it's not working out, it's not the end. Welcome back, everyone, to For All the Saints podcast. And I've got a very special guest today. Amy, thank you so much for coming on today. Sure. Great to be here. Thank you. And uh, I have many, many questions. And I want to just get to know you and your work a bit more first. Uh, in that, how long have you been a match? Is it a matchmaker that you officially are? Uh, and yeah, yes, how long I'm a professional been- matchmaker. I've been doing this for 13 years and I left a job as an executive recruiter to start my business, Latter-day Matchmaker. And I found that it was a really transferable skill set, finding hard to hard to find skill sets for for jobs. And then with my clients, it's usually a very unique person that I'm looking for. And so I found out about matchmaking. It's really big on the East Coast in the U.S. There's a lot of matchmakers out there because people are so busy working and don't have time to look for dates. And there's a matchmaking institute that I am certified through. Right. And I, so uh, I have that... a huge network of matchmakers throughout the world. Right, that's so interesting that you came from a recruitment background. I hadn't, I'd never thought before that that would have like a, a transferable, skill. But like that seems very logical <laughs> that it would. Um, what is your like day to day then when you're matchmaking? How much of it is actually interviewing people, and how much is going through, looking at, all the different people? Yeah, it's probably half and half. So. I meet with my potential client first and we go through a number of things in a two hour session where I'm really getting to know them. Um, for the matchmaking VIP service, I that's only men that I take for that one. And so in that meeting, I'm trying to get to know him, what his relationship history is and what the criteria is for who he's looking for. And I'll delve really deep into that so he's got this list right of I want her to be kind I want her to be an active church member I want her to be attractive right so I'm going to drill down into each one of those and really find out well kindness what does that mean to you what are some examples of kindness that you've seen from previous relationships or just people you know and then I can really understand what they mean because it could mean different things to different people And same with attraction. Everyone has their different um, things that they're attracted to. And so I really want to understand that. I also do show photos of potential matches to get an idea of what their range of attraction is. So if it's very narrow, um, we find that out pretty quickly. I, I show them a variety of different types of looks and women in different situations. So maybe divorced with kids or never been married or whatever it might be and get their reaction to that situation. Would you be up for a date with this woman? And it's so fun to work with clients that are super open. That doesn't always happen, but um, when it does, I just feel like they're very coachable. They're in a really good place because they want to put, they want to kind of give this to God and see what happens, how they can connect with the different types of people And so I'm also assessing them and determining, okay, I did show them all these photos, but are these women likely to be interested? And so after we meet and decide to move forward in a program, I will go back over the, because I usually show 30 women, and let's say they said yes to half of those, then I'm going to reach out maybe to seven to 10, um, because some I will think you know, she's probably not the best fit, even though he said yes, like what she's looking for, what I know about her, she might not be interested in him. And so I'm really all the all throughout the process, I'm personalizing it to the client 
I'm working on their behalf and their best interest. So then I reach out to the women that I want to interview and go through another assessment for them to, to see like, who are you interested in meeting? How do you envision a future relationship? And so once I understand her, if it seems like a good match, I'll present my client to her with some photos and information. And if she's interested, then I go back to my client and say, you know, she said, yes, let's plan a date. And I arrange all those details. I do have a lot of clients who fly into Utah for dates um, throughout the U.S. I have done some online where we do Zoom dates as well. And so that I think post-COVID has has worked really well. And there's a lot of Zoom dating tips that I give and how to be successful there. And ultimately, you know, I need to know if these people are willing to relocate. Like if one is, but one isn't, then that could work. But if neither are, then I probably won't set them up. So you've you've started something or you're working on a new project at the moment called matchmakingsaints.com. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what is what is the difference between what you have been doing and this new project? Yes. So after 13 years of being a professional personalized matchmaker, there's a lot of um, things where I can't reach as many people. I'm working with a select number of individuals and it's also an expensive service because I'm taking so much time with my clients. And so I came up with this new idea that would help more people get matched. And so on Matchmaking Saints, there's quite a few differences between just your typical online dating site or app. One of them being it is powered by a real life matchmaker. And I'm not aware of any other website that has that feature. In fact, most you can't even reach anyone even for a technical issue. And so people will send in questions about dating um, and I'll respond. And I also am always on the lookout. We do verify everyone that signs up through a government issued ID and a selfie in it. It, it is through Stripe. And so Stripe will verify and say, yes, the, the two facial structures, they match. Um, so that's one thing we're able to really eliminate the scammers and the catfishers that you see on other websites. Another thing though, that was sort of the vision in why I created this site is you can create an account for yourself and we have a lot of people doing that. So they're essentially their own matchmaker with tips from a, a, a matchmaker, but you can also create an account for your loved one. So let's say you're married and you have a brother, sister, cousin, friend that's single and they maybe are discouraged with dating maybe they've never felt comfortable putting themselves out there or maybe they have and it hasn't worked uh, but regardless you are offering to be their matchmaker and you create the account for them and run it and of course you would get their permission and it would send them an identification <clears throat> verification link so everything's on the up and up. <laughs> and so the account would say, let's say her name's Sarah. Sarah's your sister. And it would say, Sarah managed by Ben. So when you send messages to guys, you're saying, hey, I'm Sarah's brother. And I'd love to talk to you about her and see if you guys might want to go on a date. And this is something they do in other countries where matchmaking is so big in Asia and India and the whole family is kind of involved. Um, and so it's a fun way to bring kind of renewed hope and just lightheartedly help people find love. And parents love this. They are excited that they have a way to help their kids that are so discouraged. And it, it's just been fun. I, um, I have a cousin whose account I've been managing for her and she's already been out on a few dates in the short time we've launched Matchmaking Saints and these are quality men and I have screened other guys out that haven't been a match that have messaged her and 
I just let them know, hey, it doesn't seem like a good fit. And so she gets to enjoy the benefits of dating without all of the uh, the vulnerability, the frustration. Sometimes people feel frustrated when they go on on dating apps and sites and they're not getting the kind of response they want or, you know, they're getting people that they feel are not a match or creepy or just whatever they don't like. And they also have a lot of thinking errors. So I've worked with a lot of singles who they, I'll sit with them while they're on their app and we'll look at the profiles together and I'll say, okay, is this a yes or no? And some of their reasons for saying no are so just random. Uh, like they're they're crossing people off without even giving them a chance. So for example, uh, she might like the way he looks, his basic profile, but she doesn't like that he lives in another location. So she's not even going to give it a try. Or she doesn't like that he's so into sports or so into the outdoors or whatever it is, right? So she's going to just cross him off. And the reality is, you know, you're just seeing a small aspect of that person on their profile. And so why not screen in and at least send a message and see how that feels. And then I'm always going to encourage to to meet as many people because the more dates you go on, the more chance you have for getting into a relationship. And now, of course, there's there's red flags and there's deal breakers. I'm not saying that you should screen everyone in either. But I have had people where, you know, oh, she has cats and I have a dog and that just wouldn't work, right? Well, how do you know? You're making a lot of assumptions that she's so tied to her cat or what if her cat is like really old and it's going to die soon? Is she going to really need to get another cat? Or maybe she meets you and you fulfill a lot of that sort of love that she was giving to that pet. And she doesn't feel like she needs that or vice versa. Um Maybe she loves dogs and she feels like the cat and dog could get along. So it's just don't arbitrarily screen someone out. Um, I've seen women screen out guys because he didn't write a very good profile. And my response to that is we're not looking for a guy who is good at online dating. We're looking for a great guy for you. And so let's see where it could go. Let's message him and and just see so the more messages you send and the more dates you're going to go on and so i'm always encouraging more dating and less analyzation right that that's really interesting i have a lot of questions from this um, <laughs> i'm trying to which one should i pick first uh well i actually read a stat today um 75 percent of people in a this was a massive survey done in america a few months ago 75% of people find it hard to find people to date without looking online. And so uh, I do find it really interesting that you've done this approach, but sort of alleviating those things you would initially feel worried about. Like, uh, I I haven't really used um, online dating. Um, I, I'm married, so I'm, I'm coming at this more out of curiosity and with lots of people who will be watching who will yeah. uh, real time apply these things. But yeah, I can imagine there are worries about safety, worries about different things. But um, when people are matching with people, mm -hmm. is, is there a, what are the best ways and tips for how you approach that once you make a match? Or, or are there some common errors? Oh, so once they start communicating, you mean? Or once they... Yes, what, once they start initially communicating. Yes, I, I use something called the care formula. So when you're reaching out and sending a message, it would be a really good idea to give them a compliment. So that's the C. And then another thing that people don't always do is to ask questions. So a lot of people forget to ask questions when they're reaching out. They might even cut and paste their profile that the person can already read. And they're, they're kind of just saying, here's like a huge paragraph about me. And let me know if you're up for a date type of thing where it would be much better, especially with men. Women often feel like men don't ask enough questions. And so even on the dates, but, you know, starting with the messaging, 
So if, if you notice some things, if you actually read her profile and see that she's into, you know, football or maybe she loves to bake or cook, uh, why not be like, what's your favorite dish? What's your specialty? And that can get the conversation and connection going much faster than sharing about yourself because she can always already read that stuff and you want it to happen more naturally and organic than for you to just throw a bunch of information at her. Um, but after you ask the questions and as you're messaging, of course you can relate back to her. You know what? I love cooking too. Or wow, I've never been into cooking that you get bonus points and kind of flirt with her. And so you're relating, that's the R and you're empathizing. So, you know, maybe she shares, you know, gosh, I just got done being sick for two weeks. And so I'm really crazy busy at work. Well, empathize. Oh, wow. That must be really hard. And it seems really easy in a lot of ways, but people do forget to show empathy in the beginning stages. Maybe they're nervous. So they forget to, to kind of think about that other person and how they might be feeling. Right. And what are the uh, main struggles or differences between this happening with people who are Latter-day Saints and this when it happens just generally in in normality? <laughs> yeah, so because I have a huge network of matchmakers, we collaborate all the time. And even though they don't have necessarily all of our same values, the the issues are still the same. You know, women are frustrated that men don't ask enough questions and men are frustrated because women are analyzing things too much. Um, that's sort of like a total <laughs> um, stereotype. But but I'm just saying when I see the posts that other matchmakers are making about their clients and their community, they're very similar issues. Right. I see. That, that's interesting. Um, how about like the mismatches between the sexes? You know, like I'm interested in what you were saying there again about, well, women stereotypically go stereotypically overanalyze and men stereotypically don't ask enough or show enough. And, and I'm wondering, as a man, what is it that generally women may want that I may actually think is the opposite? You know, things we misunderstand. Yes, yes. Good question. So we use the... 17 Secrets to the Male and Female Psychology by Elisa Snell. She's my dating coach that a lot of my clients will work with on a deeper level. I'm doing the matchmaking, the connecting, and I'm doing coaching through the process. But she meets with them one-on-one -on -one and helps them really dive into their psyche and the male and female psyche. So the number one thing for women is they want to feel safe and secure. And that starts with the messaging online if a guy messages her and says you're hot she is not ready for that and that does not make her feel safe and secure instead she you know she can react in a variety of different ways she might feel like oh wow i've always had men that just like me for my body whatever i'm not even going to respond to this guy or you know i don't like that he's calling me sexy and he's not getting to know me first um, there's just li different like alarm bells that go off in a woman's head. Um, and so you, you need to keep that in mind. And even on the first date, um, it, maybe let's say you're struggling to find a great job. Well, you don't want to lay out all of your issues for her on that first date. That will come in time. And so if you go into the date and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't find any jobs and it's not even worth applying anymore or whatever she's gonna feel like oh my gosh like this guy i don't feel any safety and security not that he has to be the only breadwinner but she also doesn't want to be the only breadwinner in the family and so that can cause issues as well so there's a lot of different things that tie back to safety and security for women so it'd be it would be wise for a man to try to you know even talk to other women to find out how what makes them feel safe and secure and even him getting to know her and listening and validating, that makes her feel safe and secure with her 
emotions and it creates that emotional connection. And with men, it's different. They want to feel like he, like he can really make her happy. And so it's hard when he goes on a date or in the messages and she's complaining. Men sometimes take the complaining personally. Like let's say she's at the restaurant and she doesn't like her salad and he feels like a failure because he picked the restaurant or he, he wanted this to be a perfect experience. And yeah, there's some thinking errors going on, but keep in mind that men are maybe more fragile than we give them credit for. You know, men are sensitive, but they, they have been programmed often to not show that and not to be vulnerable. And so if he's on the date, um, he's less likely to connect emotionally because he hasn't been programmed to do that. And so it's really both genders working together to really understand the other one. And there's a lot of things we could get into like attachment styles, but um, women tend to be more, if they like the guy, they might be a little more anxious and almost pursuing it too much instead of matching his efforts. And so it's important to be able to read those cues and understand, well, he usually responds back, you know, within a couple hours when we message. So I don't want to respond back right away. And that might make him feel pressure. Like I'm too into this. We haven't even met yet, but vice versa. You don't want to play a game and be like, well, I'm not going to respond for two days and I'm playing hard to get because he probably men like instant validation. <laughs> they don't want to um, wait. They'll move on to someone else. If you're playing too hard to get. That was uh, that game is frustrating. I remember when I was uh, dating my current wife um, now, and, and I, I would try to play it cool and uh, and be like, okay, I, I'm gonna. She's messaged back. I'm gonna wait for a bit, uh, just to <laughs> not look too keen. But then when she didn't reply straight away, I was like, oh, she's gone off me or something. <laughs> so those... you get it. You get it. And there's there's attraction factors that both men and women have. Um, for women, confidence in a guy is really high on the list almost more than physical looks. So if, if you can play your cards right and be confident, even if you don't fully feel confident, but think of ways that you can phrase things, um, like maybe she didn't respond for a few days and she's like, oh, I'm sorry, it took me a while. And she's like, so you could say, hey, no worries, you're worth the wait, right? And so maybe inside you're no. feeling a little frustrated, but you're spinning it to say something more confident. and. Her seeing that is going to make her more interested. She feels safer now that she isn't having to play a game as much and she can be forthright and that you're going to respond and work on taking it well. I mean, she doesn't know how you feel for sure, but just that confidence language is really helpful. Right. Considering these mismatches and... Um what men really want, what women really want, and all of that. What to you is the ideal first date that you would recommend? Well, I do think activity dates are ideal. They're not always convenient or possible. But if you can, find something maybe that has, like in the U.S., we have Top Golf, And that's where you can go to this kind of cool driving range situation and they bring you food. And so you're eating too, but you're not sitting across from each other with all this pressure of you have to always know what to say at the right time. And you have to do this ping pong of like one talks and then the other. So that can be pretty stressful for a lot of people. And they do say that men bond through activities even more than women. Women bond through activities, but they also bond through talking. And that's not always the case with men. They tend to bond more through doing something that they enjoy, and those endorphins are released, and that connection is built. Yeah, so I've I've heard of this. So men bond through their vasopressin receptors, and women bond through their oxytocin re receptors. Yes, yeah, yes. I don't know if I'm getting the words. Uh, so vasopressin meaning like almost the stress of going through something new challenging yes. and that's how they really bond with someone 
and the oxytocin is more like quality time um feeling valued because of the the nature of the conversation or you know that and so i guess when you merge those two together that must be a a really strong bond i'm, I'm guessing i heard that from another uh therapist i think i'm a therapist or, or someone yeah and i've seen this happen where i maybe they aren't necessarily on paper initially as excited about this woman or this guy they do this and they go on the date and it's bonding and they feel great so they want another date right i see yeah well uh a good example of this was uh uh, I'd be interested to get your take on this is me and my wife were considering what our first date should be back in the day and uh, we decided to go to the Houses of Parliament in the UK oh wow <laughs> which we laugh at now but uh, well, we, you both like we were, it that's great well the the first time I asked her about something I, I messaged her and said I see you're interested in politics and because uh, she had like posted something years ago about politics I thought well, that's something at least. And then, I don't know, we ended up going to Parliament together, but it was great because I learned a bunch of new stuff about Parliament <laughs> and we had a good talk uh, in London. So um, that was, uh, I suppose, that was us and that created what must have been a decent bond. But um, yeah, That's great. See, you get, you get this process. <laughs> uh, I often joke that I've got a, a good success rate with women because my only real relationship has been with my current <laughs> wife and, You've got and so we can marry each other. <laughs> uh, so, but considering like the latter-day saint view to dating what would be your tips on what's the right way to date with the intention of marrying which we know that most latter-day saints sort of have they they go into it with a different viewpoint almost of I'm kind of looking for an eternal marriage. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's smart to operate under the assumption that most people are looking for marriage. Um, and whether they come right out and say that on their profile or they're playing it cool and uh, just acting like they're chilling out and just want to meet people. At the end of the day, when I talk to singles, it is very rare that I hear them say they don't want to be married, but how they're approaching it varies a lot. And um, when my clients are meeting with our dating coach, Elisa, she's taking them through the five stages of dating. And so in this, in stage zero, <laughs> that's when you're looking for dates. And then when you're on a date, you should have the goals be focused on where you're at in the dating process. So People tend to think too far ahead, the fifth stage being engaged and marriage. And so they, on the first day, often they're thinking, gosh, could I marry this person? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I like blonde hair or I mean, silly things, but I, I'm not sure that I like that gap in his teeth, whatever it is, or vice versa. I don't know if I, I don't know if she wants to get married because she has this great career and it doesn't even seem like she has room for anyone in her life. I don't even know if she wants kids, right? So I would highly recommend not going there to stay in the moment, to focus on having an enjoyable, fun date and making the other person feel great by asking them questions, acknowledging them, validating them. And if let's say that you really think you're not going to be interested in them and you're on this date, well, it's a great opportunity to practice your relationship skills. And because I actually do th something with my clients called feedback dating. And so they go on a date with my, my one of my professional feedback daters and they know it's a feedback date, but they're supposed to act like they would on a date that was someone they're really excited about. And so a lot of times the pushback I get about acting interested and excited on a first date is, well, I don't want to lead them on. And it's not leading them on. It's it's having an enjoyable time. And then it's either, either a yes or no to go on another date. Um, sometimes people are a maybe, but if they are a maybe, I would encourage them to turn that to a yes and go on a second date. It can't hurt. 
And especially if you don't have anyone or very many people in your dating pool, because at first you're going to be just going out casually with different people. And if you don't even have anyone else, then why not go on a second date? And so on the second date, progressing further, we recommend that you don't become exclusive for six weeks at least, because you might think it's a home run on that first date and maybe have the define the relationship talk right away. But the reality is you don't know that person. You haven't seen their quirks. You haven't seen them upset. You haven't seen how they treat their family or whatever it is. And you really need to slow down. It's all those endorphins that are being released that are clouding your logic. And so we recommend, you know, date for six weeks, but still go out with other people, but be clear about that. And you don't have to make a big deal out of it, but you can say things like, hey, I really enjoyed getting to know you and I really want to continue that. And my approach to dating is to keep seeing other people until I'm exclusive. But um, when, if and when that we get to that point, I'd love to have that conversation. But for now, um, we'll just focus on having fun. And so people, they get way too serious. You know, sometimes people go on the first date and they want to bear their soul share all their weaknesses, just get it out of the way. Because if they can't accept me for who I am, then what's the point? Well, that's not really a fair thing to do because you don't have any kind of a emotional connection yet. And so there's no reason for you to stay because you don't feel safe in that relationship. If they're, you know, sharing all of their deep, dark secrets, maybe you've repented of all these things. And, um, so let's say they ask about your divorce and, it was a really ugly divorce, whether you felt like it was your fault or your spouse's. Um, you don't really want to go into that whole story with them. It's okay to share kind of an overview. Like, you know, we had a lot of challenges and I gave it a good go. And at the end of the day, it just, we, I had to move on. But that's a story for another day when we know each other better. Um, and so if someone's trying to ask those questions, you can always assertively and gently Uh, redirect the conversation and say, hey, I'd love to share it with you. I don't have anything to hide, but I'd rather do that when we know each other better. And most people will respond to that. If they don't, if they get upset or pressure you, that's a good sign that they don't have empathy and that definitely there's a red flag there. So my overall advice in response to your question is that you need to stay in the stage that you're in and not try to jump into the later stages of dating where you, you're exclusive, you're problem solving, and you're engaged. Right. And going to before getting to this stage even, um, how does one spiritually prepare themselves for finding the one they could potentially marry? Mm, I love that. So I'm usually, most people make some kind of a wish list of who they want to be with, right? Um, Whether it's a top 10 or just like a journal entry. Well, the next step would be to ask yourself, am I those things? Am I kind? Am I attractive? Like reasonably attractive? Do I take good care of myself? Um, And what changes do I need to make um, if I feel like there's a gap there? And so get feedback even from other people that you trust and who care about you. And they would be more than happy usually to, to share their insights, but you really need to understand where the gaps are and take that to God, ask him to show you where the gaps are, especially if you're in a situation where you feel like what I am doing is not working. Something needs to change. So give it to God ask him to help you, but then he still expects you to do your part. So if you're saying, I hear this a lot, I don't want to do online dating. I don't want to go to singles events because I feel like my social anxiety or whatever. And I, I don't want to date anyone in my ward. I mean, the list goes on that what they don't want to do. Well, what if you were a missionary and you said, I don't want to do tracting because I hate just knocking on a random person's door And I just feel too fearful to do that. And I don't really like member referrals because, you know, the members, it's really hard to get them. I mean, the members just don't give very many referrals. So it seems like a waste of time. And I don't like street contacting because, 
you know, I'm just like totally exposed. I don't want to just walk up to someone. Usually they say no. So you're, you're sitting in your apartment and you're praying for these baptisms that you set as a goal that month. Well, do you think the, the Heavenly Father is going to bless you with that? <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. I've, uh, I've never thought of it like that before. Um, you do have to get out of your comfort zone a bit. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And, um, well, sticking on that, you you brought up something that I would like to ask, actually, about um, church and uh, wards and such. And, well, what are your thoughts on YSA or YA wards and young adult sacrament services and, and things like that? Do you think they are effective? Um, <laughs> are they counterintuitive, you know, basing on adding those already sort of pressurizing social dating dynamics, but sure. in a place of worship. Yeah, I think it's that debate. I mean, there's both sides and it's a very heated argument either way, but I don't think any of us can deny that people meet in those wards, the YSA ward. I think the challenge comes when they graduate from the YSA age range and ward, because at that point, point statistically speaking there are fewer options at 31 plus or you know some places do have the mid single ward 31 to 45 um but then you graduate from that one and there's not another ward so it's very hard to meet people um and a lot of people i mean in utah it's certainly a better chance but it's still very difficult i'm in utah and people feel very discouraged. They almost feel like it's this single sentence of never getting married when they graduate the YSA ward. And I think that dating and marriage definitely affects people's testimony. And so in order to get through it, um, it's very important to be prayerful and in tune with the Lord because otherwise you can let the adversary just wreak havoc on your psyche about you know, maybe there's a reason you're not married. You're such a loser. You should have, you know, done more when you were younger or you're just not attractive enough. I mean, there's all these messages. And so we need to identify what those messages are and what our fears are. And once we identify what our fears are, and then we can counteract those fears and really dig deep on, well, is that really true? Is it true that I'm not attractive at all and that no one would find me attractive? Well, I think that that's definitely not true because there's a match for everyone. And it, it just brings people's testimony down because they start to connect dots back to God that shouldn't be there. They're saying, well, if God loved me, I'd be married by now. Or, you know, I feel like I've been let down by the church because I haven't met anyone. So I'm just not going to go. And that's a downward spiral that is very depressing to go down. Yeah, I, I do definitely think that there's, um, yeah, wh when you see people graduate, as you say, from from these wards, it, I'm sure it would be discouraging. And what would, you've gave, given some great fundamental, like spiritual things there, but what advice would you give to those people practically on next steps for finding people? I, I know... Um, I found a stat today as well. I've been on my stats. I love stats. <laughs> that, um, well, we said the one before about 75% find it hard to find people to date without looking online already. Mm -hmm. And then also 69% of people are content with being single. And we, I think we're seeing that increasingly more today. So I, I don't know, what would you say in advice wise to those people who are graduating and may just become fondant or lose hope? Um, yeah. Well, first right. of all, I just like to say that I have a lot of empathy for these people. So I got married at 42. I was married for a short time in my 20s, um, and it lasted not very long at all. But then I spent 12 years in the single scene. Uh, you know, I graduated from the YSA ward. I, I was a mint single, in, and we do have a singles ward that I went to. And it was during that time that I started my business when I was 37. And I was, you know, exploring what I could do that would be more fulfilling. And I think that I felt very guided to do this. 
um, as sort of a calling in life. And I, it was through doing this that I eventually did meet my husband it, through doing matchmaking. Um, but I did not do that without struggles. I mean, I just want to share a couple personal things to give people some hope because um, it's easy to look at someone and say, oh, they've got the three kids, they've got the five kids, they've got everything that I want, and there's no way I would ever get there. Well, so when I was 38, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and then I went through chemo and lost all my hair and, you know, body parts. And so it was it was sort of mortifying at first to get this news, but then somehow through the grace of God, I was given the ability to become really positive through it and I had a blog and I would write things kind of humorous about my experiences going through this and um, one of them for example was that the my oncologist said that it was okay to kiss guys <laughs> and at first I thought well you know I'm never gonna date during chemo well I ended up dating almost more than I did when I wasn't going through chemo I just felt like this support from people and I felt like I was kind of exposed but um, in a good way and I had people reaching out to me and giving me well wishes. And I actually had parties like chemo kickoff party or, you know, done with cancer party. And and that was really fun. And so I did date. And then I, you know, I didn't find the one yet. But after a couple of years, um, I had a guy that wanted to sign up as a matchmaking client. And then he decided to ask me out instead. And so he never became the client. He became my husband. And at that point in life, we got married at 42 and he had already had six kids. Um, but I hadn't had any kids and I really wanted that. But going through chemo, it does mess with your fertility. And so... I was very sad after we got married. I didn't think I'd be quite that sad, but we were able to meet with doctors and through medical miracles, um, I have my three kiddos. And I had my twin boys at 44 and my daughter was born when I was 46. So I'm a much what? older mom, but I wouldn't trade it for anything I got. I wish I never, I got discouraged, but I never took my eye off of my goal, which was, an eternal marriage and family. And it's like what the quote by Elder Holland, like some blessings come late, some come don't come until heaven. But for those who embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, they do come. That's an incredible story. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And uh, I'm sure that will bring a lot of people listening hope as well. Um, not just in dating, but in other ways too, you know, staying positive through trials as well. Um, well, so. well, and in response to your question, if I can just share a little more about what I did, yeah. my approach to dating and that I taught my clients is make a, a list of all the things you can do to find people to date. So don't just rely on one method, create an, a diversified approach. So identify singles events that you can go to on a regular basis. Um, do online dating and really make an effort. So set a time, maybe it's in an hour or 30 minutes a day. Or for me, I would spend two or three hours on every Sunday going through. And I was on all of the sites, partially because I was a matchmaker and I wanted to do market research, but also for myself. And so I would spend several hours reaching out, messaging guys. I wasn't afraid to do that, not just wait for them to message me and I dated regularly and it was something where I felt empowered as a woman to do things to help me find dates instead of sitting home and feeling like no one wants me, you know, I, here I lost all my hair or whatever it is. Um, but I can, I can take control and do something about it. And of course, involving the Lord in that process, let friends know that you're open to setups and, some people think, well, I'll seem desperate. Well, you can say it in a confident way. Maybe you're sending them a message or you're talking to them, but saying, you know what, I've given this a lot of thought and I really want to find someone. And so I'm putting myself out there. 
I feel like this is my year to find love, maybe a new year's goal. And, and then ask them, you know, if you know anyone who is a quality person that he, you think I would match with, please let me know. We can talk about them and see if I really feel that they would be. And then I'd love an introduction. Right. Uh, what's your view of social media in the process of, of dating and finding someone? I feel like there's uh it, it may make it harder in many ways. It may make it easier in many ways, but they seem to, we, I've spoken, I've heard on other podcasts about the sort of illusion of choice that it gives. And True. that, yeah. you know, I, uh, I definitely think let's look at the positive sides and focus on those. So, you know, right. when I was single, I would go to an event and there would be, you know, 50 people there, for example, a small, smaller group. <laughs> And maybe I chat with a guy and I think he's pretty cool, but I don't know if we're ever going to see each other again because he was just there randomly. Well, I went and looked him up on Facebook. We connected and I sent him kind of a confident, flirtatious message and he asked me out. So it was fun because we dated for a while from that one situation. If I hadn't gone to social media, it can definitely be a great supplement to dating they even do have, you know, Facebook dating. And I, I know some people that have met through that. So I wouldn't discount that. I think it's important to try new things and to being open to trying new things. Yeah, I, I like the way you put it, a supplement, using it as a supplement. I think that's a really positive, good way of looking at it. And uh, bringing up, forgive me for using another statistic, but 49% uh, of people think or said in the survey that it's acceptable to stalk a date online before going out with them. Um, I'd love to get your response to that. Yes, I would love to respond to that. So I don't allow my clients to stalk their dates. I don't give out last names or other identifying information um, to definitely avoid that because it can kill the process and a lot of dates don't happen because they looked them up on social media but on the flip side, if you already, like, let's say you met someone at your ward or you notice someone for from afar, I think it's great to reach out to them. And when we use the word stalk, I think it's like tongue in cheek. But there are people that come across as stalkers. And sometimes men don't respect that women want their privacy and don't necessarily want to be bombarded. But if you are going to reach out to a woman, make sure that you check yourself that is this coming across in a creepy or non-creepy way <laughs> um and so i think it's fine if a guy notices a girl and maybe she's a friend of a friend and he's just saw her tagged in a photo well great why not reach out and say hey i just noticed you on my my friend ben's profile and you look like a great person i i wanted to reach out and just see if you're up for connecting um, and, and, you know, you want to sort of in that situation, you might have to start a little milder and a little slower because it's not an online dating site and you have to feel out what her comfort level is. So if she responds and says something like, yeah, let's chat, respect that and chat with her before going to ask her out. But I, I would say the flip side on, on a dating apps that you need to ask out sooner rather than later or make it known that you'd like to go on a date. So if you're a woman and, you know, you had a couple of exchanges back and forth, I think it's important that you say, you know, you seem like a great guy. I would love to meet you. And if he doesn't respond and just wants a pen pal, then maybe you move on at that point. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll also add on a free tip to everyone from my own personal experience with social media. It's is don't do what I did, which was after yeah. my first date um, with my current wife, uh, I decided to do a post about it on Facebook and uh, <laughs> said I had a great day with uh, Olivia and uh, I tagged her and put a photo on and uh, I I was rubbish at dating. I didn't really do it. Um, was she upset and, by that? She, she was like, Oh, <laughs> like I don't know that I want Asia. That was one date. What if you know you're tagging me and everyone else sees it, or word just gets around? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I was. Uh, I'm still taunted about that to this day. I will know the day after I was. I realized just what a fool I'd been, and I deleted it as I was eating my Sunday dinner. And well, uh, but I still a big number. Yeah, that's a perfect example, though. Of you don't have to be perfect. You're going to have situations where you wish you could rewind what you did, but you still got married to her, right? And <laughs> it doesn't mean you'll get married to that person that you made the mistake with, but maybe you'll it'll be a stepping stone for the next person, right? So don't beat yourself up either. Yes, it's hard not to because it was embarrassing, but I, you know, let it be known for everyone. Don't do that. Um, well, Amy, thank you again. I, I've got a, a couple more questions, but I'm sort of concluding this now with with a big grand question of if there's one thing that you could let all uh, Latter-day Saint people know who are in that stage of thinking about dating, uh, what would it be? What would you wish they could know? Uh, one thing. Uh, there's so many things. I, a lot of things that I've shared it, it is kind of a theme that let's replace our fear with faith and hope in dating and see where that gets us. Because I promise when you do that, you will have different results and you will enjoy the process more. And at the end of the day, things are going to work out. Um, it's like President Hinckley. Everything works out in the end. If it's not working out, it's not the end. Mm -hmm. That's a really good, uh, a really good insight there. Um, before we close, I just want to go back to what we were talking at the start. Your new project, uh, Matchmaking Saints, and uh, well, firstly, is that just available around Utah? Where do you have to be to sign on to it? Oh, sure. So most of the signups right now are in the U.S. Um, we have had a few people internationally that unfortunately there's not going to be as many people interested because of the location barrier, but there could be people that are open to that. So I wouldn't knock it. Um, it is a free site, so anyone can join as long as you're willing to identify yourself. And we also do free events like we're having a speed dating event on January 9th in the evening, 8.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So I guess in the UK, I'm not sure what time that is, but it's probably something like four in the morning. Um, yeah. But we are offering things like this to just help people have a renewed hope, have a new way to connect with people. And so check it out. It's an amazing new resource for you and for your family. Mm -hmm. It sounds fantastic and it sounds like such a great idea as you said before, sort of alleviating many of those concerns that come with online dating, as well as making it the fact that it is for Latter-day Saints. Um, yeah. So is there anything that you want people to be signposted to with matchmaking saints or want them to specifically know about? Well, another feature that is very unique to our site, and it may not be as big yet but as the site grows it's going to be fabulous we have an event feature so you can create an event on the site and invite different people and the intent there is you can do a private event you can do a public event maybe you just want to have a public uh, activity and invite people from the site or whoever wants to come or maybe you want to do a private event maybe you want to get to know both men and women, you're in this new city or you've been there a while and you just don't feel like you have a lot of single friends. Well, maybe you could plan a, a dinner date and strategically invite people that you feel like you would connect with. And that way it's not a date, but you're just g getting out there in a, a less uh, pressured environment. That's fantastic. It sounds brilliant. Um, I wish I had this as well as all of your advice when I was considering <laughs> dating because I was uh, very much reliant on random opinions and asking people. <laughs> so, but, you know, we're here through the thick and the thin to tell the tale. And I'm so grateful, Amy, that you came and um, shared a bit of time with me today. And I implore people to go and visit matchmakingsaints.com as well as uh, 
as your own stuff as well. You you've done some writing. I've been reading some of your articles, and you've got Instagram, which we've just connected on as well. So yeah, I I hope people will go and check that out. And yeah, thank you very much, Amy. And if I could add just one more thing for singles who are wondering where their place is in the church, don't forget how powerful a force you are for good. And when you use that energy and focus it, um, sometimes you can do more than you, you would be able to if you were married. I know there's singles groups that go on these great humanitarian trips. Um, many singles serve in their family wards in leadership callings. And I was in a family ward for a while and my bishop called me in and said, I want you to be in the young women because I know it's that at some point these young women are going to find themselves single and maybe they'll be divorced, maybe they'll be widowed or just haven't found anyone. And I want you to set an example for them and teach them how to be happy and thriving as a single woman in the church. Thank you for that. Amen. (laughs) <laughs> That's a great message. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for watching For All The Saints. This show needs your help to grow. Please like the video, comment your thoughts, subscribe to the channel, and share this with someone you think would enjoy it. Thank you.